The Prison Epistles, a class overview by Amanda Ramos. First, we will discuss some quick facts about the prison epistles. Then we will focus specifically on one epistle. We will be looking at the book of Colossians, its background, the heresy influencing the church, and Paul's response. The prison epistles were letters written by Paul to churches throughout the Roman Empire. They are called the prison epistles because they were written while Paul was under house arrest in Rome, sometime between the years 61 to 63 AD. During this time, he had visitors and wrote letters to congregations. Each letter has a different audience and purpose. However, there are some consistent themes, like the promise of suffering, joy, and contentment, standing firm in the face of trials and in the face of false doctrine. In his letters, he provides theology, instruction, encouragement, and even poetry. The four prison epistles are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. They each bear the name of their recipient. It is important to note that among Christian scholars, there is some debate on the authorship of these letters. They are categorized as disputed Pauline authorship and undisputed Pauline authorship. Most debate centers around the style of the letters. There is much scholarly literature on this topic that we won't have time to get into, but I will mention which ones are disputed and which ones are undisputed. Ephesians was written to the church in Ephesus and, among other things, discusses the body of Christ. This letter has disputed Pauline authorship. Philippians was written to the church in Philippi, and its themes are maturing in Christ and joy and suffering. This epistle has undisputed Pauline authorship. Colossians was written to the church in Colossae, and its main theme is the supremacy of Christ. Like Ephesians, it has disputed Pauline authorship. Philemon is the only prison epistle not written to a church, but to an individual named Philemon. This letter focuses on the reconciliation of Philemon and his former slave Onesimus. This letter is of undisputed Pauline authorship. For this video, we will be diving deeper into the book of Colossians. This epistle was written between 61 to 63 AD by Paul the Apostle. The letter was delivered by Tychicus and his companion Onesimus, the runaway slave, from the letter to Philemon. Tychicus and Onesimus also delivered Ephesians and Philemon. Paul's correspondence was meant to encourage the Colossians and provide doctrinal instruction in response to a heresy of which Epaphroditus informed Paul. The city of Colossae was located in the region of Phrygia in modern-day Turkey. Like most cities during this time, it experienced a mixture of Roman, Greek, and other cultures. Colossae was formerly an important trade city, but had fallen from prestige in Paul's time. Ephesus was about a hundred miles to the west on the coast and had surpassed Colossae in its strategic importance. The church in Colossae was founded by Epaphroditus. During Paul's time in Ephesus, it is likely that Epaphroditus and possibly Timothy went to Colossae and won the first conference and established a church there. It is also interesting to note that on the day of Pentecost, it was mentioned there were Jews from Phrygia present. It is possible that those Jews from Phrygia believed and returned to Colossae and were part of the church. Epaphroditus Epaphroditus, the founder of the Colossian church, had visited Paul in jail and gave a report of the Colossian church. Their faith was strong, yet there was a growing heresy that concerned Epaphroditus. Paul then wrote a letter to encourage them and address this heresy. We can see this heresy briefly outlined in the letter. It was a combination of three sources, Greek philosophy, ancient religions, and Judaism. They claimed a greater revelation or experience than what the Christians were experiencing. Paul refers to this as a hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces. Additionally, there were some that were apparently worshipping angels. Paul claims that these people have lost connection with the head, which is Christ. Paul also reminds them that the observance of religious festivals was a shadow of what was what to come. Harsh treatment of the body is only the appearance of wisdom, are full of self-imposed worship and false humility. So how does Paul respond to this heresy? He fills the letter with reinstating who Jesus is and our status in him. In this letter we find some of the loftiest and most beautiful language describing Christ. Here are four elements that Paul describes. 1. That Jesus is divine. In chapter 1, verse 15, he says that the Son is the image of the invisible God. And in chapter 2, verse 9, he says that in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Number 2. That we are complete in Christ. In chapter 2, verse 10, he says, In Christ you have been brought to fullness. 
Number three, that Jesus is sovereign. In chapter 2, verse 10, it says Jesus is the head over every power and authority. Number four, Jesus is the Savior. In chapter 1, verses 22 through 23, it says God has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. In Paul's depiction of Christ, he shows the insufficiency of any other belief, philosophy, or religion. Nothing can be a substitute for Christ in his supremacy. The prison epistles were written to an ancient audience, some of whose cities have now been lost. Yet their words still hold eternal value for the modern believer. Even in the midst of suffering, we see Paul rejoicing and full of hope as he awaited Jesus' return. As we anticipate his return nearly 2,000 years later, these letters provide us with hope and encourage us to live a life worthy of Christ.